Today, visualisations of the world has increasingly come to be based on photographs, naturally incorporating perspective, scale and dimension. However, ancient Egyptians' art, art followed a canon for proportions, controlling the angle of view and the scale of each element in relation to the whole. This system of depiction, termed aspective, provides the maximum information from different angles. Now I argue that for several reasons the Egyptians did leave clues within their art and writings. Now my expertise falls within the bounds of engineering toolmaker, specialising in schematic drawings. By reinterpreting the Egyptian aspective into a modern perspective, it's possible to make an educated guess and to work out the practical function for the sign or symbol. These interpretations will be supported by archaeological evidence. The analysis will be accompanied with models specifically built and to test this hypothesis. Now in this model building process, one can see the concept, concept in action and the associated problems that have to be overcome. My investigation began with the creator god Ptah. He is said to be god of craftsmen, particularly stone-based crafts. He is said to be father to Hip Imhotep, who served under King Joseph as master architect for the Steppe Pyramid. Now Ptah is always depicted carrying various symbols of ancient Egyptian mythology. The Jed, the Ankh, the Wasp Sept, Flail and Crook. Hieroglyphs or edograms emerge from the preliterate artistic traditions and later form this complex system of text. Now all ideograms resemble in one way or another the thing or idea they represent or mean. Now it's my experience that signs and symbols are usually asso associated with a person's job, i.e. a sign with a man holding a spanner would be a mechanic and someone holding a spade would depict a ground worker, a saw a joiner and a wrench would be a plumber and so on. Now, my hypothesis, my hypothesis for the building the pyramid is to prove that the signs and symbols held by Ptah are tools. And working together, this combination of tools built the pyramids of Egypt. One of the most popular and puzzling ideograms of ancient Egypt is the Jed symbol. Its original meaning is still unclear. The symbol is held by the creator god Ptah and was often painted on the bottom of coffins where the deceased bod backbone would rest. It was for this reason the Jed is said to re represent the spinal column. It also stood for stability. It was an opening of paths, a magician and a divine spirit. A complex and a bewildering array of interpretations. However, I wasn't convinced that this symbol represented an idea and was non empirical My initial reaction to the Jed pillar, that was some type of vertical windlass. A premise that the circular end of the crook sat over the protrusion at the top of the jed. This upper portion acted as a pivot point, thus in, per in perspective the assemblage would appear as a round post. Several distinct features reinforced this idea, the most important being the flare at the base of the jed. This, fe this feature is a prerequisite for any type of winch or windlass. The second feature are the four upper crossbars. These are said to depict the spinal column, however, if the circular theme is maintained, the crossbars would be interpreted as three spools. A hint as to the spool's use would be Faulkner's description of this picture, of horse stands pulling on, on rope, thus the spools would always be wound with rope. As you can see on the wall behind me, I like to make models. Holding them gives you an understanding and it concentrates the mind, and if you don't do, you won't know. Now this is the model of the Jed and this is a crook and I, I assume the crook uh, uh, sat over the top of the protrusion of the Jed like that. So then these four crossbars you normally see on the Jed would now become three spools. So this would keep the top of the Jed in, in position and um, what holds the bottom of the Jed I'll come to later on. But these three spools obviously if you pull on them you rewind you wind out the uh, jed and you could tie a tow rope to the bottom. The problem you're going to encounter now is how do you rewind the ropes back onto the spools? And the answer is if we rewind one of the spools the opposite direction. So I'll fast forward and then. Um... So we rewind the middle spool the opposite way. So we can pull the spools that way. And then one, when we want to rewind the rope, we pull this rope the other way and it rewinds, rewinds the rope onto the spools. The problem you've got 
is that when the when the rope's getting rewound, if these if there's men if there's a man standing on the end pulling it that way, as he's rewinding it, he's got to keep the tension in it so the rope doesn't drop or it'll just get caught in the other spools. So the answer to it is the ank. The ank the ank is fixed to the end of this. Let me get the thing. you place this little ring with the ank, the ank is looped onto the end. You'll notice all all anks have got um, a, like a tapered end. I think this is for this is a cartouche rope, just a rope with a stick on the end. That's all. And you put a lark's head knot. Well, let's just assume we're talking about this power rope at the minute. This power rope is fixed with a little lark's head knot on the end. There. So no matter how how hard you pull it, it's getting it, it won't it won't come off, right? So there's a couple of guys. So that's where your power rope goes. Now the rope to keep this anchor at the same height goes on on the side. So you'd link again two car two cartouche ropes to the side, and you'd pull, and that would pull it off the ground. The, the loop of the ank is where all these other ropes, these cartouche ropes, are tied to. So you tie your, tie your ropes to, to the loop of the ank and then you could pull pull on it. So you could, you could the loop, it, it, the, sh the loop's shaped like that, so you can not only just get one man or two or three, so you can get 10 or 20, maybe 40 people all pulling on this ank. I think the ank stands for, um, rather than life, it's power. Or it gives life to the Jed. Anyway, I decided to build a small working model. And like I said, you can see the associated problems by building a working model. Now this in this clip you can see you know, the guy in the blue jacket, he, he's walking backwards, he's rewinding the Jed. And the two guys there, one, the, one on the right and the one on the left. They were, they were working on the power ropes. Now you can see that they've just got them tangled a little bit. So the ropes needs to go straight on like I showed you before. I'm, I'm directing him so he's out of the way of the, uh, of the load getting pulled up the hill. I'm tightening, the, I'm tightening the tow rope at the base of the jet. Now the guys walk backwards. I tighten the tow rope and the load comes up the path. And you can just see the guy in the blue jacket. He's, he's, now he's walking backwards. And he's rewinding the jed once again, and you just keep repeating this process. The boys work, the boys walk backwards. I tighten the tow rope, and the load comes up the ramp. And yeah, we said, well, that was easy. Well, it was easy. Now, when I made the model, I had no idea how the the bottom part of the jed was fixed to the floor or what type of system it had. Um, so my initial reaction was just to make um, some type of pivot on the bottom. Um, the Jed's depicted standing on a stone pedestal. Um, so I can only assume that the stone pedestal, there was some type of ball and socket arrangement in the bottom of it. So I made this um, square stone and a, and a little round socket to go in it. So it's, it, it swivels on that. Um, now. In the Temple of Abydos, where the Seti the, Seti the First is, you can see the, the raising of the Jed pillar, and it, it's shown depicted standing on a stone on a stone pedestal. So I just assumed at the time that perhaps the stone pedestal there was some, some type of um, ball and socket arrangement in there. Anyway, it was about two months later. I searched the internet looking for any type of stone pedestal. Really, I just put but um, Egyptian bowls in in the Google search engine, and surprisingly, I came across this. It's a um, an alabaster stone receptacle. Nobody knows really what they were for. I can I'm pretty sure now that they are for uh, for standing the jed. And if so, the scale of the thing, um, the scale of the of the stone in in the picture of, of Seti, 
against the stone at uh, the Sun Temple here will give you an idea of actually how big the Jed was. Um, in my mind, it's it, somewhere in the region of 14, perhaps even 15 foot tall. On the right here, you can see Seti is presenting the artisan with two reams of cloth. Um, the artisan is said to be uh, dressing the Jed. Um, what he's actually doing is covering the uh, the flare at the, at, the, at the base because obviously the, the ball and socket arrangement at the bottom have oil in it. Um, and the last thing you want is sand to get in, in your oil or can contaminate it. So the question is, where do you place the Jed on the pyramid? Now one of my first experiments showed a weakness in the base. In fact, the, the ball pulled out of the bottom of the pedestal and he needed a, a socket for the, for the pedestal to sit in. Now Khufu's pyramid has square sockets on each, each of its four corners. Um, and current thinking suggests they were there and somehow interlink the casing stones and to stop them from moving. But it was obviously double up as a socket for the pedestal. That means one jed on each corner, making four jeds in total. One of the greatest advantages of, of a vertical windlass is that you can hold two loads at the same time. So this is the windlass in the corner of the pyramid. This is the corner. And you've got a, a load coming from this direction and a load from coming from this direction. You would just tie the two tow ropes around the base of the jed and haul it up and it would pull two loads at the same time. In fact, it would balance the mechanism too. I want to quickly talk about ramps. Now I found the answer in the tomb of Unus um, from utterances on the south wall of the antechamber. Now utterance 389 it says, Mother Unus, you wild cow and wife, who as a cow is on the grassy hill, who as a woman or vulture is on the mount of the ZZ bird. They stand fast, the two jed pillars, the broken off steps come down. Now that's the important part. Um, now next one is 390, three, Unus ascends on that ladder which his father Ray has made for him. Now coincidentally I just read a book uh, made by, uh, printed by Clark and Engelbach um, on Egyptian construction and one of the last entries describes a set of broken stairs. Now it says the earliest stairway yet known which is constructed of lay blocks is one leading up to the roof of one of the small chapels which is believed to have been formed for the Heb Set or festival temple of King Joseph at Saqqara. It's freestanding and shows peculiarities not encountered elsewhere. Each step is formed of a separate block which engages into a small recess cut into the block below it. The angle of the riser or front of the step is not vertical but at a right angle to the surface of the tread. My research strongly suggests these steps are a set of ramps after they were dismantled from the pyramid, redressed and used for this secondary purpose. To reverse engineer the step, one must assume the recess at the rear of the block was to facilitate a snug fit to the block above. Now by transferring the height and angle of this recess to the front of the block, it's now possible to determine the original length of each ramp. Um, and I've worked it out, it's somewhere between just under a metre long and 16 degrees in, in, in the angle. 